So you want to make a successful indie game, maybe even a few indie games. <laughs> you, you're looking to get into game making as a hobby or a side project, or maybe even building it into a career in the future. Well, here's how to do it. <laughs> I'm a game design major, uh, four years into a five-year program, and I have worked on several indie level games and for several small indie studios. And in fact, I co-founded um, an indie studio that has published a whole ass game. <laughs> Digital janitors that we published ourselves. I was involved from concepting stages to developing as an artist. I was an artist on the team and helping marketing and publishing and learning all about that process. So here's just a disclaimer. Also, um, I will be talking about like business side and money making to games, but my game itself was essentially a class project because everybody on our, our team, which was six people, um, are in the same like class of our major. So we essentially signed on to do this project as like, even though it's technically an extracurricular and not an assignment for any one particular class. It was the intention of building our portfolios within the, the comfort of being in a university setting where we still had like other classes and uh, other responsibilities. So the goal and intention of it wasn't to make money necessarily, it was to expand our portfolios. So just being said, um, I have developed games from both a business perspective, right? Uh, working for studios who are selling this game or selling a game as a product and then also as a hobbyist and as a passion project on the side. So a lot of people nowadays want to romanticize the idea of making a huge indie hit, right? So there's the Stardew Valleys, the Undertales, the Minecrafts, etc. Um, and they want to focus on their, their like a single developer who want to create for themselves um, through hard laborious work for many years, a mega hit like that. And so I just want to start by saying something that might be humbling you if you're watching this video going into game making with that sort of perception. You're like, how am I going to make the next big hit? Well, if your mindset is that you want to be a millionaire off of making games, go do something else <laughs> because for every one Minecraft and every one Undertale, there are thousands of amazing but unknown games uh, sitting right now on itch.io or sitting on Steam that have um, relatively minuscule player bases, but took just as long, if not longer to develop, right? And so I'm not saying that you will never make the next big hit, but I'm saying that if you're going into games, thinking about how do I make this game a hit rather than how do I make this game a good game, you're going to be making something that is difficult for you and is a slog and um, you're just going in it with the wrong mindset, right? Because there's so much higher of a chance of a game being a failure if your standard for success is millions of dollars. If your standard for success is that you learned something or that you built a small community or that you were able to start and finish a game project, if those are your measures of success rather than millions of dollars, then you are going to be so much more likely to find a personal success. And so any other successes that come with that, right, um, are going to be all the sweeter. So don't go in here thinking, I wanna make Fortnite 2, I wanna make Skyrim 2, I wanna make, um, <laughs> you know, the greatest game ever made. Don't do that. Go into it thinking, I wanna make something that I'm passionate about and that I'm proud of. If your goal is to make a product and like Sigma grind set, like grind out this like hardcore project um, to make money, you're better off getting a job at like a Subway or something and Sigma grind set those sandwiches because <laughs> that guaranteed wage um, for the same amount of time is probably gonna make you a lot more money overall. It shouldn't be, you can you can go in thinking, I would like to eventually make money. Like that's a totally reasonable thing to make or to think about during this, but don't have it, have it be about the game more than it's about the money, um, especially at the indie level. And all that being said, if you're going in thinking, I, I've never made a game before, but I think I can really, I mean, like I love games. So I would love to go try and 
and create my own, right? So that's also kind of like a fundamental mindset flaw <laughs> that you can only learn um, by going ahead and starting that game making process um, and, and trying your hand at game development. You'll find that game making is something completely different than making games, right? So if, if you find that you begin this development process and it's a total slog, it is like so much more difficult and complex than what you thought it would be, there's no shame in just turning back and stopping, right? Because um, trying to commit to something that actively is harming you, at, like what's the point of that? Like why keel over just because you, you, you feel like in your head you're like, if I just take this a little bit further, I'm sure I'll find the fun in game development. The truth is, is that if you if you don't think that the infinite complexity of game development is something that is stimulating, it's just actively stressful, then don't then don't do that. <laughs> find a different art making process that you find is stimulating to you, but doesn't cause you like excessive stress. That being said, if you find that you try out game development and it's something that is fun and stimulating and challenging, but also like doable eventually to you, then, then you can begin to take your next steps in game making. <laughs> the path that I took in, in getting into development is probably the least efficient way to do it, which is that I go to university to learn how to make games um, in an academic school setting, right? So, I, my mindset was I'm going to go to college either way because that's just the culture that I am from and grew up in is that I have to go to a university, but I, I am an artist. <laughs> so what am I supposed to do? So I went into game design as like an art making outlook and I just so happened to find that I think it was right for me. Um, if you're, if you're like a normal person <laughs> and college is not in the cards for you right now, then that's what this section is about. Um, if you find that you are in a position in life where it's possible for you to go to university, but you're questioning whether or not it should be in game design, I have a whole separate video that I made about that a long time ago that I'll point you to right now. Go check that out, right? Um, but if you find that you just want to do it as a hobby or a side thing, or you don't have the means or access to go to college because you are like a person with a life <laughs> that you have to work around to to become a game developer, then how are you gonna go about that? Well, lucky for you, a lot of resources exist right now um, that you can easily access for free to see if game development is right for you. If you have like zero coding and zero artistic skills and zero dollars to spend <laughs> on this hobby, um, then the fastest way that you are going to learn is if you, if you download Unity right now <laughs> for free, um, and it's like industry standard for game development, an extremely powerful indie game engine um, that is once again free. And Unity themselves actually provide a course for free online that's Unity Learn that you can follow to learn like the very basic fundamentals of game development. Um, but in terms of like how to spend your time beyond that first basics course, uh, to develop your interests further. What I recommend to be the fastest way to learn how to develop games is to take gameplay moments from games that you enjoy already and try and figure out how to make those exist from scratch in Unity. Like you don't even need assets or anything visual. Use like default cubes or default capsules in Unity or download some free assets, um, like Mixamo animations and stuff like that. And try and figure out how to make gameplay moments exist just by themselves from scratch in Unity. And I guarantee if you just take a couple weeks of your life to try and figure out those problems of how to make this mechanic based on what you do know, the basics, I guarantee you will learn so much more in that couple of weeks of, of testing and playing and discovering than I have ever learned in my <laughs> university courses. Like I've taken four years of like drawing 101 and cinematography and stuff like that. And essentially like farted around for the past four years, um, which I thankfully have the luxury to do. But if that's not something you have the luxury of time for to just fart around, having that focused time of learning for like a month or whatever, 
is going to teach you all that you need to know to be a fundamentally successful game developer. Once you spend that time learning your way around game mechanics and that that concept of game problem solving, um, whether that is through the exploration of trying to copy game mechanics that exist or just following tutorials on how to how to recreate small games from scratch, um, that's when you can decide really if game development is fun for you. Because if you found that the, the slog of trying to discover how to make these mechanics work was not fun for you, it was too complex, it was too difficult, you found yourself being annoyed and frustrated and and the feedback of getting something to work if you even could was like not enough to justify that stress then this is the point where you step away game development is like fundamentally about problem solving and is thus really stressful to people who find that finding issues to complex problems is not for them because even if you manage to solve like really small game development problems in the beginning like you figure out how to make something say like, hello world, right? <laughs> and code that classic starting thing. If you want to take that problem solving ability further, uh, it's going to be infinitely difficult and get only exponentially more difficult to solve these problems as your games get more complex. So if you can't, if you find yourself not finding any enjoyment in solving these issues at a, at a fundamental level, then step away now because let me let me give you an example of how this can spiral out of hand. Um, you manage to follow these tutorials easily, but then you you come up with your own. You want to build a, a simple level where you're making a car follow a track to a finish line. So, what are some of these issues that exist that you need to solve as a game developer on just this really simple concept? Well, now you have to decide how does the car go. Is it, um, what input button is it? Uh, how far does it go based off of the input? Does it continue to go if you continue to hold down the button? How does it stop once it's started going? Does it just stop? Does it have to slow to a stop? Is it based on how hard you press a button? Um, how fast is the maximum speed limit of the car? Is the track straight? Does it have altitude? Does it have obstacles? Uh, how far away is the distance? How long are you driving? What do you see on the scenery when you're driving? Do you how do you have a collision system that keeps the car on the ground? Do you have gravity that keeps the car on the ground? You know, there's like so many infinitely complex issues with even the most basic gameplay and sense. So that's what I'm saying is that people are not considering these things when they're playing a game. When they're playing a game and they're like ah, the sword hits the man's head and this makes me feel good, right? But the developer has to think at what speed is the sword traveling in order to make the feedback of it hitting the enemy's head feel good to the player, you know? So it's, it's an altered mindset that you just have to, you can only begin to understand if you start attempting to develop. And like I said, at this point, don't go in there with that mindset of I'm going to make the next big hit, first you just need to decide is game development fun for you? And if it's not, stop now, go paint, <laughs> go read a book, go do something else. Uh, save yourself while you can. Okay, so you you learn how to develop a game somewhat, right? You you have the basics down, you follow, you follow the Unity Learn tutorials, you've managed to recreate a few of your favorite um, gameplay moments from your favorite games in unity from scratch and it was fun it was a fun problem solving moment for you now you want to commit to making your own game project um here's what i'll say concepting it from the beginning is the easiest part right because this is before the slog of actually making it a reality hopefully um by beginning that process of developing it from a gameplay moment it will help narrow down what's possible in your brain and thereby make the project more clear from the beginning because if you're if you're developing from um the gameplay up right so what was fun for you to develop and how can you expand that into a full-length game like how can you expand that core gameplay loop that you've already figured out how to make fun into long form process. And that is a much better mindset going in than 
what a lot of people tend to do who are not game developers is they will think of a universe first that they want to see or that they want to play in. They'll think about the world, the characters, the narrative, all that before they think about the gameplay. And that is a horrible way to think about it because um, gameplay is what's driving a game. So if you are not thinking about gameplay, then you are not thinking about a game, you're thinking about a world, which can exist in many different media, which, it, which might serve it better, right? Like Game of Thrones exists as a book, as a movie, as a game, as several games. Um, and it's, that is possible because it started as a book, which served the rest of these adaptations, but still probably a lot of people will say is the best version of it because the book format allowed that world to shine and those characters to shine. And that, that doesn't mean that the game is the best medium to serve the world that you are concepting. If you were going in world first, characters first, interactions first, like interactions between characters, then that is not going to make your life easier because then you're thinking like really grand scale, how do I serve the world rather than how do I serve the moment to moment fun of the player. So go gameplay first. And that's really difficult for people to think about because they're like, but I have this great world concept that would serve so amazingly as a game to explore in and to do all that stuff and have this open world. And the truth is, is that an open world game sandbox style thing is going to be the most complex game that you could ever possibly make and is essentially <laughs> like unachievable at the indie level. You know, Breath of the Wild might be your inspiration as a gamer, right? Like you might be like, this is the greatest game I've ever played, but you will find that it will be the most impossible game to make. So don't even go into game development. Just just don't do it if, if your only concept is to create a world. Go into, write a novel, right? Go write a novel, go write, um, go make some art, you know, make a comic book. That is going to be, it's difficult. Like that stuff's difficult too. But a game is like probably the most complex medium that you could ever choose to serve the function of talking about a world. So don't do it. <laughs> Build your game from that core gameplay loop and then up. I will say if you're if you're like hell bent on making a game for your world that you're creating, maybe start. It's like possible, but start in a different way than what you might be thinking. Instead of taking your world and making Skyrim 2 <laughs> um, or Breath of the Wild 2, open up Twine. That's like a program that they use to teach us about like fundamental like storytelling in a gamified way. Cause you can make choices. It's like a choose your own adventure program where you're, you're programming it to have like certain paths that you can take. And that's probably, probably the easiest way for you to be making a game based off a world, so it's like possible. But that's not you um, expanding your horizons practically as a game developer. That's just you serving the world that you created. So maybe you're more of like a narrative writer or just a writer, really, to be honest, <laughs> at that point, if you're making Twine games. But that can be a lot of fun for you to see if, if the fun of it for you is programming the choices, of which case maybe you should go try out something different in Unity, or if it's just seeing your world come to life. So all that said, if you're not interested in building a world necessarily, and you find that the fun of discovering game, gameplay making, like game developing, is, is the fun of it, of like the medium itself, um, of discovering how to solve these little problems, you can still aspire to build a world but think about creating a world the other way. Instead of thinking about like grand concepts first, think about that core gameplay and expanding it up. Build a world from that gameplay rather than making up gameplay that can serve the world, right? So making a world that serves what you're interested in programmatically and where that fun loop exists in gameplay. I guarantee that mindset of building up from from scratch, like from like little tiny instances of like thinking about every second of gameplay first and then building up from there will make much more interesting games overall than if you're trying to um, think about it from this huge scope from the start. You're just gonna get lost, lost in the process really if you, if you start too big. Oh, so you have your gameplay loop. 
how do you even build up from there, right? So like, let's say your, your fundamental gameplay loop is that you're clicking on something and getting feedback from that click that feels good, right? <laughs> so like you're clicking and aiming and each time you hit a target with your um, mouse in a certain time limit, then that's when you're getting your feedback. That's your loop. That is a shooting game. I, I, I don't know how else to, <laughs> like a lot of people don't realize that that click, click aim, that's the core mechanic of a shooting game, but that can also apply to a game like Digital Janitors, my indie game. <laughs> that's a 90s Y2K desktop sorting file um, feeling, right? Your genre is like you're a file sorting desktop, but your core gameplay is that you're clicking and aiming precisely. Um, we expand on that by having you drag your target further into like these goals. But you could also take that core mechanic and put it in a completely different setting. Like POV, you're a monkey. POV, POV you're a monkey in the jungle and you want to grab bananas, right? But that's just aim and click, aim and click. Um, but that POV, you're a monkey is building up on the core gameplay of click on a banana. So that's that's what I mean. That's like probably a horrible example, but finding that gameplay that you can figure out how to make work for you and then building up from there into a world that serves that is gonna be a lot more interesting and actually probably a lot more creative than the other way around. So you have your setting based on that loop. That's when you get to take, take that concept and um, take your next steps into building an actual game. Whoever had a dreams that that you um you had you 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 can your demo is going to be just that demonstrating that you have the ability to actually make the game in some way right so instead of just saying I'm going to make a game where I am doing blank you are showing that that game can exist at least at some rudimentary level right. You should be going into the demo with the mindset that you are able to create something that at least functions at its most minimal existence to demonstrate what the entire game will have, right? So you're not making the whole game, you're making what we call a vertical slice where everything that you want to exist in the final product in some capacity exists in the demo. So if you're making that shooter, the shooter game, and you want it to eventually have a variety of throwables and power-ups and unlockables or whatever, then you are making at least one usable grenade if you, if that's what a genre of thing that you want to have in the game. And you're having at least one playable power-up um, and you have it set in, in one complete contained experience. So if you want multiple levels that are all themed a certain way in the game, like let's say it's... Um, a World War II shooter or, or a, like a war themed shooter, like we need another one of those, but let's say that's the one you're making. Um, you're probably gonna wanna set it in like, if it's World War II, then have it on like the beaches of Normandy on D-Day or something, something that fits that theme and vibe, not like a unicorn um, happy dreamland or whatever, just to be fun and spicy or whatever. That's, it, if that's not the long-term goal of the vibe of the game, then don't put that in the demo because then people will be shocked when it's not a unicorn dreamland shooter and you're actually in the war-torn trenches of like World War II. Like that's, it has to be reflective of the vibe of the, it's like a vibe check. A demo is like a vibe check, but <laughs> that when players play it, the comments that they're making on the demo should be reflective of comments that they would make on the whole game. Because that's the whole point of your demo really is it's not just to prove to yourself that you have the capacity to make a complete experience. It's also so that you can share that demo um, and have people give you feedback on that. And that feedback will be relevant to your game making experience and it will alter your development in a positive way. Because these games that you're making really should aspire to be a malleable thing that changes a little over the course of development. You should be able to be willing from a mindset perspective to alter what you're doing to chase the fun. That not just the fun of what's good to develop, but when you have people play the game and they give you feedback and they're like, this part was fun, that's the part you should be focusing on. Not the parts that you think will probably be fun or that you plan on having be fun. 
you should be flexible enough at this stage especially to be honing in on those aspects that the players are spending the most time on because ultimately as a game as a medium right not just as a singular game you want people playing it for as long as possible you want people engaged with it because if a game is not engaging and interactive and a and fun right that's the key word here then players will not play and then there's no point to what you've done a game cannot exist <laughs> without without players if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it does it make a sound the answer is no this is about like philosophically in in the game making world a game cannot truly exist if nobody plays it that's all very um theoretical and abstract but the point is that what you're trying to achieve in this demo ultimately is the satisfaction of knowing that you can build a complete experience and when i mean complete experience i mean something that's not like fundamentally broken something that displays that these uh that these gameplay loops exist in a functioning executable and something that will not wreck somebody's computer like you should have like at least a start menu and a pause menu and an exit button right and this should be at least five to ten minutes of gameplay or reflective of however long gameplay should be so like if it's if it's something that's level based at least one complete level if it's something that's like infinite like let's say you were really inspired by temple run and you wanted to make temple run then yeah you should be able to infinitely play the game right if that's what the goal is you should have that procedural mechanic already in place if that's something that you foresee being like a long-term thing but also don't get bogged down on having it be it should just display the basics it should be basically what the game is most at, at its most fundamental part um and now if you have all of that in a functioning executable uh now we get to the part where you actually try and gather the feedback that you need to go forward Bruh. So you have a demo <laughs> how do you get the word out and i just want to emphasize at this point that building a community as an indie game developer is actually probably the most important part and this is like really understated in modern indie game portrayals right because uh people talk about the successes of undertale and minecraft and stuff like that but they don't talk about the community being the reason for that success that people will talk about the hard work of the developer in developing this innovative gameplay moment but they're not talking about the huge communities that were created alongside these games that are the real reason for their success so if you are thinking that your measure of success is monetary right you will not be a monetary success as a game if you do not invest time in building that community that means marketing <laughs> <laughs> which is like this horrible um like frightening concept to people who have never had to think about social media as like a money making device or as a way to advertise or spread the word as an indie game developer you need to be thinking assuming that money is any form of a goal here how you can get the word out on your game because if you built if you develop the most amazing game that anybody has ever or could ever play, but nobody has ever heard of it, then you made the best game that nobody's ever played. This is the same, this is like the tree that falls in the wood <laughs> and, and nobody's there to hear it. Then it never happened. It never existed. So investing time into marketing is important, not just to make money. It's not just about making money. It's about that core community, right? That, I mean, if you have that, then the money will come. But the point is that having the community is important because you need to find people to give you feedback, to tell you if what you're making along the way is actually interesting, if it actually looks compelling, if it's actually fun. And so these people, if you have a community, are going to be, hopefully, uh, assuming you build a community of people who you would want to hear from, they're going to be invaluable in shaping the direction of your game in a way that will make it more successful you know if the masses are exposed to it beyond the community that you managed to build um 
And it's also just fun to have people who care, who care about what you're developing and who care about the effort that you're putting in and who are interested to hear about how it's going. So the question is, how do you build that community? Well, here's the first thing is that you need to be in it with the perspective of these people that are here to help you. They're here to help you grow. They're not just numbers and they're not inconvenient nuisances who are here to troll you. Because a lot of people um, who stumble upon a community are not appreciative of how few games really can build that and how special a community can be. Let's look at Yandre Dev and <laughs> Yandre Simulator, a game that has um, existed online for 10 years plus, is just now finally getting to the point of completion. But this is a guy who's known for being secretive, aloof, and hateful towards the community. Um, he will not respond to feedback. He has actively patched out solutions that people have found to problems in the game, like creative solutions that exist within the essentially sandbox that this developer has created, right? Um, and this developer has been like, I am mad that you are not doing exactly what I intended you to do, right? So I'm gonna patch out this creative solution that you found. And that's like hateful and spiteful for what? Like people obviously care enough to find unique and interesting ways and fun with like, these people are having fun in the game that you made. And then you're going to go and like be spiteful of that. There's no point. So you should not be going in with this perfectionist attitude of like, I made this game a certain way to be played a certain way. No, people are showing you where they are having fun in a game that you created. So let them have their fun, you know, build on that fun, make it easier for them to have that fun. Um, and you'll find that the game will not only be received well, right? By these people who you, who you are rewarding for engaging with you in your game, but it'll also be more fun <laughs> and that's the whole point right we're making games so that people can play them and have fun that's if, if your point if the point of your game is for people to absentmindedly consume them and go great work uh put art up in a gallery right <laughs> coming from a traditional art background if you want people to just absentmindedly consume then it does it shouldn't be something that they are invited to interact with right? If the point is for them to interact and that's what they're doing and they're telling you about how that experience is, you should be listening. Uh, how? Let's say you're going in with this positive mindset. How do you actually build that community? How do you go in and, and find people to play your game and to be committed to the project? Well, I mean, if you're sincere about it and, and have that positive outlook, people will flock to that. They flock to passion. They flock to things that are clearly have this potential Right? So people want to be passionate about things, good or bad. So if you only give them the opportunity to see like good, kind-hearted passion, then, then people will flock to that. I mean, people will flock to stuff that's like a, like a trash fire too, but that's not, hopefully that's not what you're going for. <laughs> um, what I'll say is if you are a single developer, in an ideal world, you have a whole separate person or team working on just marketing your game to get the word out there if you're trying to make it like a huge fiscal success. But if you're just one person who's just trying to sincerely build an actual feedback, honest community, like a feedback driven community, uh, go about it by picking the social media channels that you already enjoy and commit to those. You know, like I want to say you should be giving an equal amount of time to optimize success on every single platform that has any sort of audience, but that's just not realistic. So let's say that you are like an active Discord user and you're already in game related discords. Focus on those, focus on those communities that you're already a part of and share your your time developing with them, honestly, and with, you know, just like seeking advice or just showing what you're, you're proud of and people will flock to that. If you're a Reddit user, then just stick to Reddit and make maybe like a separate account for your game or, or don't, you could just be a person, like a, a single solo development team, um, and make an account for that and just talk about your game honestly earnestly make it's about quality i think long term to have like a real like the numbers are fine if you're if you're committing to just getting numbers um but getting people behind your game getting people to actively engage in your game and care about your game i think is going to be a much more meaningful way to go about it than just a numbers game getting eyes on the game period, you know, um, 
that's not to say that numbers aren't addicting. Like we love to see follower counts go up and as people, we love to see just the number of likes that we can get. You know, that's like a big issue with social media. But I think long term, your best bet is to just commit to what works for you and what you know that you can actually commit to long term and post quality content on and the community will come. Um, some quick side advice if you aren't already like an active TikTok user and you're not and you're scared of it or whatever. I will say TikTok right now to me as a developer seems like the fastest way that you can go about getting new exposure to something because people don't have to follow you on TikTok to consume your media and they don't even have to search for it. It will be presented to them if the algorithm thinks that your game content that you're making is something that they would actively enjoy. So you are on TikTok like fundamentally going to be having your content be exposed to people who care about it probably already. Uh, so that's a great way for discovery to happen is if you're making like high quality TikToks about your game. Um, I would say do some research to see if that's something that's like feasible for you, but that's probably my recommendation. If you're gonna pick one platform that you're not already actively engaging in to try and promote your game, I'm gonna say TikTok is the way to go. <laughs> on that one. And something else to consider is the concept of a Kickstarter, right? So that's where you're putting your game out there for a limited campaign and making money actively. So not just Kickstarter, but also like GoFundMes, Indiegogo's, whatever. Kickstarter is like the most famous one for indie game development, I think at this point. Um, or I guess Indiegogo is like meant for that, but uh, something to consider before launching a Kickstarter is that yes, you w might get money but it's probably more effective if you already have a small community established. So it's more of like a mid to late, mid kind of development sort of thing to think about. Um, but also consider that now you have the pressures of people have money invested in you. <laughs> so that's like an added like stressor in the game development sphere because now this is not, now this is not necessarily like a fun little side hobby. Now this is like, oh, people will like, hate me if I fail to deliver what was promised to them in my own Kickstarter, right? So that's something to think about. I mean, if you find that your your community is growing pretty quickly with game development and, they, and they're in, passionate about seeing that project through, they'll probably be willing to send a few dollars your way on a Kickstarter and that money can probably help cover some initial development costs. Um, but it may or may not be worth it for you in the long term. Just do your research and choose carefully about what you're engaging in, especially when money's involved. And just to reiterate, I've said a lot about like general marketing concepts, but really when you're building a community, try not to think about it too much as marketing. Think about it as you're finding people to play your game and to tell you how to take your game to the next level in terms of um, player feedback and finding what's fun, because that should be your priority. If you can manage to, to find a community of people who care, they will make you feel like these warm, fuzzy little butterflies when they tell you about the best parts. So you should listen to what they have to say, because I think that they're like legitimately like your greatest, greatest successes in, in game development is finding those instances of people who, who were affected by what you've made. That will be the stuff that inspires you to keep going for sure. Okay, yippee, you, you've built this whole <laughs> community, you've, you've built a whole game, and that game has been shaped based off of that community feedback. Well, now what do you do? Um, let's say that it's feature complete, and everything that you want to be in the game, that not just that you want to be in the game, I should say that needs to be in the game in order for it to feel complete, because people will always want to add more, but then that's what we call like feature creep, um, that's when a game becomes overscoped and muddied. And this is something that we tried to avoid in the beginning, right? So let's just say that it has everything that it needs to have in order to be complete and hopefully should be asking people to play it more than two hours <laughs> because here's a fun fact about Steam is that you can, you can actually um, return a game, no questions asked if you played it for less than two hours. So if you, you have built this whole game, but the whole thing is completable, easily and satisfactorily in less than two hours, now you have 
a bunch of returns on your hand. So just maybe try to make a, a game that compels people to play for more than two hours, maybe well above two hours, like at least five, if you can help it. But anyway, it, it works and is fun is the point. Um, what now? Well, now you get the game out. <laughs> um, hopefully if it if it's working and feature complete and you are satisfied with it maybe you're like well there's a few things i would change here and there don't get bogged down on that if i were you before i would release full scale i would probably have an alpha at some point you know that people can play that demonstrates a vast majority of the features of the gameplay and then they can give you feedback on that and from there that's when you decide whether a game is ready to be published or not. If a lot of people are finding that the game is broken or something that you thought was fun is not fun, then that's when you take that time, that final stretch of gameplay development to make sure that your game is being as effective as it can be. If if players at an alpha stage, maybe like everything's in there, but it's not fully complete, are telling you that your game has some fundamental issues, uh, hopefully you would have caught that in the demo stage, right? Like your your features are, are just not playing well. They're just not fun. Then that's when you take the time to consider what you actually want to polish or if something needs to be cut. Like maybe it's as simple as like one of the grenades is clearly worse than the others despite being unlocked at the same time. Then either find a way to make that grenade different and more fun or just cut it. Don't waste your time if, if you feel... Because you're trying to make these gameplay cycles, or not these, these game development cycles as short as possible. The less time you spend on a game, the less it will hurt if it's not maybe the success that you thought it was. Um, and the more time you have to try something new that could be even better in the future, right? So we're not trying to spend five years on these games. We're trying to spend six months or less, or maybe as much as a year, hopefully less, really hopefully less than a year, to develop a complete game. Um, which is not what you hear about, like you hear about Minecraft and Stardew Valley being like 10 year long projects or whatever. Um, but that's not actually the key to success in, in my mind as a developer. You're more, if you're developing two games a year rather than one game every five years, then you've doubled your chances in that year of discovering gold right or discovering something that you never thought would be possible in your game development journey so you're really trying to keep these development cycles as short as possible so that means sacrificing some polish generally or some aspect of perfection but these games are also like living things you should consider that as well like you can go back and patch a game you can even add dlc you can make a sequel but the point is to get it out fast enough so that people can tell you what worked and so you can learn from that and what didn't work and you can learn from that as well. So just just try and publish as soon as a game has everything that you feel like it needs to have at minimum to work. Um, where do you publish? Well, some people might have dreams of like pitching to a publisher, but I'm gonna be honest and say that that's like never gonna happen <laughs> if you don't have some sort of proven track record. Like there's so many people pining to have these professional publishers publish their game. It, it's like nearly impossible um, to have an indie game with no prior experience of the developers to have a publisher. So just uh, plan to publish it yourself. It's not the end of the world. That's why, but that is why you need to market, right? Um, but anyway, you are going to probably publish on a platform that is indie friendly. So don't expect the game to launch on Xbox <laughs> or the Switch, especially day one. That's, it's very unlikely. Just plan to publish on PC, right? Or maybe the Apple Store or Google Play, you know? Um, and those will have small fees. I think it's just free to publish on, but there's a smaller paying player base. Whereas with Steam, you have a larger paying player base, um, but it does cost a hundred bucks and they do take a cut of every sale. All of these um, platforms take a cut of every sale but it's usually that first hurdle of the initial payment that people have to get over. So Steam, I think is just a hundred bucks one time and then a cut from there. Uh, the Apple store is gonna be probably, I, I think it's a hundred bucks every year and a cut of every sale. And then Google Play Store might be 25 bucks up front. You have to double check these numbers. I'm not gonna help you with legal fees and 
your everyday small business dev costs because I'm not like a business developer. Um, but just know that there are initial fees. Um, hence why you might want to do something like a Kickstarter, but if you can front a hundred bucks and that's your only expense, then that's not so bad. Um, but just publishing on those sites is your next step. Just get it out and see what people have to say. Here's some fun advice legally is that once you start making money <laughs> or here's something you have to consider also is once you get your game out and you're making money well now you have to report this on your taxes <laughs> um my company our studio formed an llc right to it's a limited liability com corporation or whatever um but we made the mistake of having all six of our team members have equal ownership and stake in the company. And that actually makes everything infinitely more complex than if you just had one CEO. So if you have a small team and you wanna divide, maybe have one person who's like the CEO of the company just for tax purposes, or maybe two, but definitely don't do six like we did. It's very complex. <laughs> and then also here's a little bit of fun Steam page discovery advice is that not only should you try to participate in steam sales whenever they come up like stay on on top of that you know try and actually have participation in the sale because that's when people are actually actively looking to buy for games a lot of times also try to manage to build enough of a community or something to get yourself 10 steam reviews when the game launches because those first 10 reviews are somewhat of like a gatekeep statistic on like this is like a hidden hidden advice thing, but um, getting 10 Steam reviews seems to be like the, the point at which Steam starts recommending your game more or allowing it to be discovered a little more. So just try to break that first threshold because the more reviews, the better, but that first 10 is gonna be your like essential hurdle when you finally do publish your game. But that's at Freddy's. That's where we wanna be. Wow, great, you did it. You published the game, woohoo. Um, at this point, your options are unlimited and I don't really have very much advice because you know this is where I am myself right now. But um, hopefully that whole process has taught you enough that you have an idea of where you wanna go going forward. If it was a lot of fun, and it didn't take 10 years <laughs> to get the game out, then get started on a new project based on what you learned or um, what were the, the most fun parts for you or what the people love, you know, about your game. You can, you can expand on that game project if you still love it. You know, you can work on a sequel right away or you can work on continuing to market this game that is still alive on Steam, right? It's still something that you can now market for the rest of your life or the rest of the game's life on Steam, right? Um, or you can maybe even try to make a DLC. I've never made a DLC, but that's, I don't, if you want. Um, or you can just move on and you can take that community that hopefully you've built and will continue to build now that the game is actually out, right? This, this doesn't mean that, oh, I'm done, let's run. If you felt like your game was not successful in some way, you can try again. Or maybe you can try something completely different. Um, you could be like, yeah, I made a game once, never again, it didn't really work out. Or you can be continuing to chase those successes that you are personally striving for based off what you learned. And if you built a community along the way, then you can take that community with you and you can tell them, hey, thanks for that first games. Here's what I learned. Here's what I would like to do different. And they can, and they can join you along the way. That's why a community is so important is because they can stick with you for an entire career, not just for one game. If you found that the game took you five years because you didn't plan it out or because you had feature creep or because of whatever reason, uh, maybe don't do that again. <laughs> Unless it worked out big time, I guess. But, you know, taking, considering both successes and failures in what you've done is really important to growing and continuing to succeed and expand your own game making perspectives. Congratulations. 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 Ah! So in conclusion, the most, I would like to reiterate like the most important part of all this to me, um, of this whole game making journey is that you really have to get into your headspace, like into the proper headspace before you can even start. 
Uh, you need to be chasing fun from the beginning until the end. You know, you need to be not thinking about a goal as a concrete thing. You need to be thinking about a game as a medium that inspires change and alterations over the course of development. You need to be um, willing to change what you thought you were going to do and instead do what you must do in order to focus on the best parts of the game. As people say, not just things that you feel are the best parts of your game. It needs to be fun to make and it needs to be fun to play. And if your game is ever at a point where it doesn't feel like it's worth it or it doesn't feel like people want to play it, then you need to stop and reassess and chase what's fun. What are people saying is fun, you know? And that that sort of mindset going in will make you so much more successful, right? And just even determining how success is thought of in your brain, it should be that you are going in with the goal of making something that you're passionate about and something that you feel is good, <laughs> is good at making people have fun, is good, is a good use of your time. It's not a stressor. Um, and it should be something that you're learning from and expanding yourself as a person and as a developer from. Be flexible is the point, <laughs> I guess, of the whole video is that you should be flexible at all points and yeah, have fun with it. Games are fun, they, they should be fun. Uh, I hope that inspire you to pursue game making if that's something that you see yourself loving. And at the same time, it should, I, I'm hoping that you will not be disappointed if at any point in game making ends up being not worth it because for a lot of people it's not worth it. For half of the people in every graduating class at my degree, it's not worth it and people will switch and find something over the course of the terms that they that they find to be more interesting or more fulfilling than game development. It's not for everybody and it's not a personal failure if you find that game development for one reason or another is not for you. You know, it's a really specific, complex, difficult, arduous thing. And that's something that people do not talk about. They just want to talk about the successes and the greatness, but there's so much more to it than that. Um, and if you're able to define your success in terms of more achievable goals, then you're going to be happier, I think. And you should be happier. You shouldn't be going in hoping to suffer, you know?